Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Well, I'm Melissa Leach, and I'm director here at IDS, and I'm incredibly pleased to welcome you all to the first in this year's series of Sussex Development Lectures. Now, the SDLs are really the sort of flagship development, development studies um, event that happens on campus, and they're co-organised by IDS, by the School of Global Studies, um, by the Centre for International Education, and by SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit, um, based in the School of Business Management and Economics, which are really four of the key units on this campus that do international development-related work. There are others as well, but these are the four who, who come together. Um, and this afternoon, for this first lecture, I'll introduce them in a moment, we're going to hear from key people in each of those schools about what they do around the theme of this year's lectures where we've chosen to focus on global development challenges. It's a big topic, um, it's an enormous area, and the angle we particularly want to take is at a time of huge challenges, how can we both understand the processes, often the quite sharp political, economic processes which are driving some of the biggest challenges we face, but also, and critically, how can we work towards what we're calling provisionally a politics of hope? What might that look like? And over the course of the year, we've got some really excellent speakers who'll be coming from all kinds of different angles to talk about this. Um, so just a couple of things um, by way of introduction. We're really keen that people tweet and, and share what you're hearing in the lectures on social media. Um, and we've got a couple of hashtags. I think they're down here at the bottom um, to let everyone know. Um, the lectures are also, this one and all the others, are also being live streamed online. Um, they go to the IDS Facebook page um, and they'll be available to watch after the event for anybody who wants to via the IDS website. And during the Q&A, we'll also be taking some questions from the online audience. So welcome out there to our online audience if you're there. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce the panel today. So we've got key research leaders from each of the, the schools who are involved in organising this series. Um, Myself, I'm speaking on behalf of, of IDS. Then we'll be turning to Professor Peter Newell, who's a professor in international relations in the School of Global Studies. Then to Mario Novelli, who's a professor in the political economy of education in CIE, which is the Centre for International Education. Um, and then to Sora Aborora, who's a senior lecturer in technology and innovation for development at SPRU. So each of us is going to give a sense of what, what our particular schools and units and institutes are doing in this field, a couple of examples, and a sort of sense of how we might be approaching these really big questions about political economies and a politics of hope. So time myself here. I'm going to begin not because IDS is more significant than any of the others, but just because I'm up here, so I will start. So IDS and global challenges, well, this is really driving what we do. I think at IDS these days, we think about development as being about tackling global challenges. And these are huge, and they range from climate and environmental catastrophe through to questions of inequality and poverty, to um, issues of insecurity and migration, to um, challenges associated with epidemics and infectious diseases, to those linked to urbanisation, to digital technologies and more. This isn't an exhaustive list. But we do find that looking across these, they all involve often really big risks for people, but also uncertainties. They're kind of quite hard to understand often. They involve sometimes short-term shocks, what often hit people as disasters, but also long-term structural drivers and stresses, which can sometimes build up. They involve interactions across scales. So although we often talk about global challenges, often the causes of those come from local processes and the impacts are also local. They're for real people in real places. And critically, um, sometimes they have technical dimensions, or we think these are all in the domain of sort of natural sciences and processes. But really crucially, they have political and social dimensions too. Um, and that's why I think at IDS we feel that there's a really crucial role for development studies writ large. Um, 
and that we need to pursue it, and there's an opportunity now to pursue it with even more courage, vitality, imagination than we have in the past. And why is that? What is it about development studies, or certainly the way we think about it at IDS, that, that gives it this, this role? One is that it's normative. Development studies is not just about understanding the world, it's about seeking to change it. IDS has a vision which is about positive transformative change. It applies to everyone everywhere, um, across North and South, terms that we don't actually use very much anymore. Um, our work is resolutely challenge focused and there I think we often do seek to analyse the processes, the political economies and the ideologies often which are shaping challenges and then seek out alternatives, often quite radical alternatives and ways forward. To do that, we think we need research that's both interdisciplinary, bringing together different social science but also natural science disciplines, and transdisciplinary, that is, it's engaged with policy, with practice, with civil society, with governments, with enlightened businesses and others. Um, and we sometimes use the term engaged excellence here to describe that work. Our work, we think, needs to be globally alert, because these are big global challenges, but they need to be grounded in the realities of people in diverse places. They need to bring together multiple forms of knowledge and to learn across them um, in a decolonial way and in a way that draws particularly on the perspectives of people living in often quite marginalised settings and places. Because in our experience, those can provide, sometimes ignored, but often vital seeds of hope and alternatives. So how do we do this? Well, IDS is quite loosely structured um, into research and knowledge clusters. And this is a list down the side here. Um, and also a number of different bigger cross-cutting centres which draw people together from different groups. And this is quite a fluid organisation and it's also very interactive. So on, often for any particular activity, we'll be combining people from an expertise from different clusters and groups. Um, we have overarching what we do um, at the moment, three really big challenges or impact areas that, where we're really seeking to make a difference. And these are the three that have been overarching, driving our work for the last five years in our current strategy. But we're going through quite an interesting process at the moment of looking at the world, looking at the disruptions, the contradictions, and updating and refreshing those big challenge areas for our next strategy, which we'll be launching in the spring. Um, so I want just to talk now in the, the remaining five minutes just about two of those big global challenge areas that are kind of building on what we've been doing over the last few years, but also looking forward. And the first is inequalities, where um, in 2016, we worked with the International Social Science Council um, in a big report called Challenging Inequalities, Pathways to a Just World. And a number of IDS fellows and researchers contributed, along with um, more than 100 authors from 40 different countries. And seeing inequality as one of the really big overarching challenges of our era, what we did in this report was to look at some of the trends, to look at the dynamics, to argue for a multi-dimensional approach which didn't just look at economic inequalities but also looked at the political, the social, the cultural, the environmental, the spatial and the knowledge inequalities which were part of the scene and the ways those often intersect to drive extreme marginalisation for people. We looked at the political economic processes driving inequalities, the consequences across multiple, multiple issues and then some of the pathways to more just futures. In terms of interactions, we found that actually reducing inequality, which we'd identified as one challenge, was going to be absolutely critical to achieve many of the others. So this is just thinking about it in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, where actually there are really strong connections between inequalities and many of the other goals, whether one's talking about conflict, health and nutrition, environment, gender, poverty and growth. If you don't tackle inequalities, you're not going to succeed very far with those. And then at the same time, tackling inequality and leaving no one behind, as the SDGs put it, is also in and of itself a moral imperative. It's about fairness. It's about a just world that we all want to live in. 
In terms of pathways forward, um, we tackled and, and saw the need to think really hard about power because on the one hand, there are all kinds of, no shortage of regulatory and policy packages which if implemented would really transform inequalities globally and within countries. And there's a big range of them and they range from global agreements through to regulating finances and markets um, and redistributing assets, domestic revenue raising, land, natural resources, along with a whole range of anti-discrimination policies. But, of course, we often see that those things aren't implemented, and that's to do with power, fundamentally. Um, and just very briefly, I think, with inequality, you have a paradox. Those with most influence over the rules, those who are sitting at the top of that current concentration of economic, political, social power, have the least interest in changing them. They're the ones who are benefiting from the status quo. Um, and they can often shape politics in their favour, ignoring the broader um, interest that there might be in tackling those inequalities. And yet, that's not the end of the story, because what we also found is that collective action and movements by citizens um, and grassroots mobilisation was really important, both in highlighting alternatives and then sometimes in pushing for change to take place. Um, so... We found, and there are documented examples in the report, of many what one might call alternative footpaths. They're often quite small. They might be the initiatives poor slum dwellers are taking um, around housing and microcredit. Um, they might be solidarity economy initiatives, different ways of organising economically. Um, or they might be, in rural areas, agroecology groups. But they have the potential to link up to coalesce with each other through networks, alliances and movement building and often quite effectively to become the kinds of bigger pathways that ultimately might help to open the spaces and transform those bigger motorways. So from that kind of overall understanding, we've now got a range of current IDS projects involving different clusters and groupings, different funders, which are taking forward what we now, we now see as the really big challenge to deal with the most extreme forms of inequity and marginalisation and to build more inclusive and accountable governance processes to tackle those. And we're doing that in relation to disability, a big programme, um, religious equalities and inclusive development, a very exciting new programme there. Um, work on gender justice and actually how it is that women can sustain some of the political and economic and social gains they've made against sometimes the patriarchal backlashes towards them. And some interesting work around child labour and around food as well as what's happening in urban settings. So all trying to build accountability to take seriously and, and give life to these solutions from below. The other, just quickly, global challenge area I wanted to mention, because I don't think others will and it's rather critical, is in the area of infectious disease and epidemics, where this is really supported as one of the kind of big challenges of our time. Um, and there's popular media and global policy concern, usually pitched around the idea that one has nasty diseases coming out of Africa or out of Asia to threaten a global world. And one sees this in Hollywood movies, um, as well as in big global science policy discourses to approach these things through ideas of one health and planetary health. And at IDS, we've been saying this is all very well, but actually, these global health and epidemic challenges also matter locally. Um, and we need much better to understand the drivers, um, the impacts, and why and to whom they matter. And so we've had a range of projects on drivers of disease in African settings. A lot of them are focused on zoonotic diseases that jump from, people to, from animals to people. We've had work um, on livestock systems and changes in those and some of the disease risks. Um, one project, for instance, has been in Myanmar looking at diseases related to pig farming. And we've been asking both how, what are the political economies driving these processes, but really critically, how are the risks understood by different people? Who is it who gets sick and why? These disease effects are distributed. It's not everybody who is vulnerable. And what does this big idea about one health, planetary health, mean locally? How do we ground it so it makes sense to people? We've also been working to respond to epidemics that have happened 
um, particularly um, the work we did a couple of years ago around the, the, the fearful West African Ebola outbreak um, in 2014 to 16. And now with the further Ebola outbreak going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where we've been seeking to understand how it is that outbreaks can become big epidemics, the reasons often being rooted in inequalities, histories of conflict, histories of distrust between peoples and teams, and then helping to use platforms and web platforms and briefings to mobilise social science knowledge in real time, help it get into the hands of the responders so that they can attune their responses to take better account of those contexts. And then finally, um, this has led into some work, again, looking at what we can learn, the seeds of hope that we can begin to build from below in work around more community-owned approaches to preparing for and responding to epidemic diseases. Um, and a group of projects there are asking how we can understand and build preparedness from below, looking at settings in East and West Africa in particular. So that's just a flavour of some of the things that we're doing. Um, and I will now hand over to Pete, who will talk about what's some of what's going on in the School of Global Studies. So. Great, thanks very much, Melissa. Um, so, yeah, my name is Peter Newell. I'm based in International Relations, just over there in ArtC, um, part of Global Studies, um, which is made up of four departments, for those of the, you that don't know Global Studies. So it's International Development, Geography, Anthropology, and International Relations. So just a word or two about where we've come from. Um, many years ago, uh, we were, were AFRAS. It was a school of African and Asian studies. And, and that legacy of the type of critical, radical, applied work that was done in that era lives on now in the way in which we approach research and teaching um, in, in global studies. And this is a bit really about our, our values, uh, really quite aligned with those of, of IDS, as we've just heard from Melissa, research that makes a difference in the world, particularly for groups that are the most marginalised or victimised by global processes of uh, inequality and, and exclusion. Uh, teaching that transforms, very much trying to te uh, gear our teaching towards uh, positive engagements uh, with key issues of the day, really across a whole range of uh, sustainable development goals um, around health and um, social inequalities, gender, climate change and sustainability. And because we, there's these four departments uh, within the one space, interdisciplinarity is really built into everything we do. Uh, which means we can explore different issues from a range of, of perspectives and work uh, collaboratively and get that sort of more holistic thinking which I think is required to tackle many of these issues. And equality, diversity, inclusion, again from this sort of longer legacy are, are written through in the, in the values that we bring to our teaching, research uh, and engagements. So as you've probably heard many times since you've all been at Sussex, we're number one in the world for development studies. Anyone in the room not heard that yet? <laughs> Um, so we're very proud of that. Um, I'm hoping that's part of the reason you're all here to study uh, development studies. Uh, but within the School of Global Studies, IR is also uh, one of the top three dedicated international relations departments, uh, anthropology being amongst the, 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 the top seven, and geography uh, doing very well as well, but particularly around its impact case studies, which is something I'll say uh, a bit more about uh, in a moment. Um, we also research um, all over the world, really. Um, at the last count, it was around 50 countries, um, Asia, Africa, Latin America, but as you can also see across Europe um, and North America. So the world comes to global studies in the form of you, students, postgraduate students, researchers and staff, uh, but also we're very active in undertaking research, critical research on different international development challenges uh, all around the world. Uh, Global Studies is also home to a whole series of research centres that address, try to address some of these key issues. So around health that Melissa was just talking about, we have a Centre for Global Health Policy uh, led by Stefan Elby. Um, there's the Centre for Cultures of Reproduction, Technologies and, and Health led by Maya and the Centre for Bio-Networking. So a whole series, again, they're working in different parts of the world looking at key global health challenges and trying to engage um, different audiences in applied and critical research on those issues. Migration is a really big theme that we tackle across the School of Global Studies. We have the Sussex Centre for Migration Research 
and the Migrating Out of Poverty Research Consortium working in uh, various parts of the world. Security, violence, uh, those sorts of issues. Again, a big theme that cuts across many other areas of our work. Uh, but there we have the Sun Sussex Centre for Conflict and Security Research and the Sussex Rights and Justice Research Centre. So again, these are sort of hosted in global studies, but they bring people across campus uh, into conversation and research projects to address those sorts of issues. Uh, around environmental issues, um, there's um, a loosely configured Sussex Climate Change Network, but we're also home to many physical geographers and people involved in the sciences. So again, coming back to what I was saying about interdisciplinarity, we're very lucky to have people from a very broad range of disciplines within global studies that can work to, together in creative and interesting ways. And of course, we're home to two key regional centres. Um, and both have active seminar series and research projects that so do check out their websites. They've got um, seminar series coming up this term, uh, lots of interesting speakers coming along. So do, do check out what they're doing and, and get involved. So overarching research themes, this is something I put together many years ago when I was director of research in global studies, but I think it still stands in terms of the broad themes that we're interested in exploring across the school. Uh, and the ways in which we try to do that, and then that final column, you can see some of the examples of how that work is, is being pursued. So global flows, understood broadly, it can be about flows of, of pollution, it can be around it, questions of finance and money. We've got several specialists, um, many of whom are in the Centre for Global Political Economy, people like Sam Canafo, working on questions of um, finance as well as debt, um, Andreas Antoniadis working on those issues. Partly also as part of this thing called the Sussex Sustainability Research Programme that some of you may have heard of. So that's another outfit, for an umbrella, if you like, that brings together people across IDS, Global Studies, and many other parts of the university. Again, also including the natural sciences uh, to study different aspects uh, of sustainability. Uh, and around global transformations, people working on urban transformations, more rural transformations, green transformations. So one of the projects, again, which brought... Uh, me and others in global studies together with colleagues in SPRU and IDS was around a book project on the politics of green transformations, looking at different pathways to sustainability, um, pathways that are more state-led, some that are more market-led and some that are more uh, nurtured from, from below, thinking about those um, issues of agency structure and power in uh, global transformations. And then, rather like IDS, um, sets of work around global inequalities and exclusions around questions of gender, class, race. And that really goes for, for all the uh, different departments we have um, in the School of Global Studies. And that's around questions of technology, health, justice, uh, gender-based violence, uh, etc. So just to sort of go into one or, two more, one or two areas to sort of illustrate some of these things, uh, one area is conflict and security. Um, so we have a lot of work on gender and security and insecurity, um, gender in counterinsurgency, the book by um, Sina Divik from International Relations, um, my colleague Anna Stavrianakis also working um, and actively engaged with activists uh, on the question of the arms trade and in particular trying to shine a critical light on the UK's active involvement um, in, in the arms trade. So she's been doing a lot of work with organisations like Safer World but has published things in the media recently trying to expose the UK's problematic role in driving uh, the global arms trade. So lots of interesting work around conflict and security, which again chimes with, with work that others are doing across uh, campus. Um, around health, so Stefan and colleagues have been doing some really interesting work on Tamiflu, um, on drugs and vaccines and the politics of that, um, how, these, how the trials are undertaken, assessments of risk, um, issues around patenting and, and control of knowledge. Um, and also, and this was very much a collaboration, I believe, with IDS, was around the uh, issue of, of Ebola that Melissa was talking about before and the, and the platform that was generated and received a great deal of recognition for the impact it had in the wake of that particular crisis. So around climate change, uh, lots going on. Again, many people in SPRU, um, in IDS and Global Studies, working on different aspects of climate change, including myself, coming at it more from the point of view of politics and political economy. Um, how on earth do we tackle this crisis? What new forms of coalitions and agency are required to tackle the incumbency, the actors that are seeking to prevent change um, and, frankly, extract every last tonne of oil out of the ground, as well as those that are trying to mobilise to try and contest that power and build new alliances to move beyond it? 
Um, and one example I'll talk about at the end is uh, something called the Rapid Transition Alliance, which I was involved in setting up with my colleague Andrew Sims, which is precisely trying to, to move in that more critical direction, and partly by showcasing what's possible. So this very much brings us back to the theme of hope. Uh, in fact, our strapline is evidence-based hope. Um, and what we try to do is generate stories, generally about one a week, so check out our website, um, across a whole range of issues, whether it's energy, water, finance, infrastructures, um, showing things that are going on all around the world, uh, right here, right now, um, that illustrate the possibility of rapid change, which will be required to get us on a 1.5 or even a 2 degree pathway. But we also look historically at when some of these big shifts have occurred before and what we can learn from them. So it's trying to sort of tell the truth, as Extinction Rebellion would put it, about the state we're in, but also trying to generate some uh, positive stories about uh, what can be done. Um, so across the board, we have something called um, an impact advisory board. So we've got people on there from, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, from DFID, from various NGOs, that advise us about our impact strategies. How can we have most impact in the world? How do we need to think about how we co-produce outputs, who we target and how? So these are sort of practitioners who will help us, um, you know, give us advice about how to maximise the impact of, of our work. Um, and it's had a, you know, a positive um, impact. Uh, it's been helping us to, to achieve the recognition through the REF and more broadly um, to make sure that our work is targeted uh, as, as, as best it can be. Uh, so, again, you know, one or two examples. Um, people in uh, development and anthropology working a lot on violence against women and girls. Um, Lindsay uh, mclean Hilkner doing that. Um, work on water security in the Middle East and peace processes. My colleague Anne Selby involved in some of that work. Interesting collaborations going back a long way with colleagues in Spru around bi the Biological Weapons Convention um, and, the, and the examples from health that I've uh, illustrated already. And just one other from the sustainability realm, um, David Ockwell, who's currently head of department in geography, done huge amounts of work on technology transfer um, and really feeding into high-level UN processes on those issues and advising governments about how to design technology transfer policies that are more pro-poor and inclusive. Uh, and so, yeah, just to sort of finish on this Rapid Transition Alliance is my final slide, and to sort of end on this note of hope, this is very much what we're trying to do. Um, we've got a coalition now of around 50 civil society organisations that are part of this alliance that contribute stories uh, to us, and we also share these resources with them so that they can try and call out inaction on these issues. Um, so when governments say, we, you know, we can't take take on board these sorts of policies. We can't undertake this energy transition. Those sorts of transport policies are not viable. They're too costly. They're impossible. We're trying to call out those forms of inaction by illustrating what's possible uh, and sharing that. And although it's largely civil society facing at the moment, we had uh, a collaboration with the Carbon Trust in London on Friday on the issue of the business of rapid transition. So more and more we're trying to engage business actors as well, which we've said less about so far, and that's a key part of our theory of change uh, in trying to build a more hopeful world. And I'll stop there. Brilliant. Thanks, Pete. Wonderful. Um, so lots going on in global studies and i think you're also beginning to pick up a theme that a lot of this work is collaborative so we've got four different schools and groups here but actually there are a lot of interactions between them quite a lot of joint programs and work which is very productive so um mario turning to you as you like i mean you might want to stand up just because you'll project more but you can because <laughs> we've got a full room yeah hello everyone um, my name is Mario Novelli, I'm the Director of the Centre for International Education, um, which this year celebrates its 30th anniversary. Um, we focus our work on the relationship with, between education and international uh, development, and I think that you know, we see education as a central... Is it okay? It's okay. Uh, we, we see education as a central... Uh, ingredient in social reproduction, in addressing many of the issues uh, in terms of climate change, inequality, gender inequalities, war, peace. And uh, over the years, we've worked across many of the schools uh, across the university and in collaboration with uh, IDS on a range of different uh, issues. Um, we also have a big 
Masters in International Education and Development. Uh, many of our students are here. That's also been running for three for 30 years. And uh, we're pleased to say that uh, this year we have uh, 43 students from 18 different nationalities. And uh, I think that reflects the diversity both of the Centre for International Education students, but also its staff that come from many different parts of the world. And I think that uh, if there's one thing that kind of uh, lies at the centre of the thinking of International uh, Education and Development Centre is the need for diversification within international development, the recognition uh, that it shouldn't be a homogenous field and that we should embrace and promote diversity of thought, uh, di diversity of identity across uh, the, the field. Of course, the field of education international development, like uh, the broader field of international development, is very much demand-driven in the sense that uh, we often are working with international development agencies, national governments, uh, international organisations, and many of us have spent our careers moving between uh, international development organisations like UNESCO, uh, producing the Global Monitoring Report, uh, myself working for, for several years in and out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the uh, of the Netherlands uh, government, but also more recently uh, with UNESCO. And uh, of course, the challenges of education, um, I'm sure that many of you are aware, uh, over 60 million children out of school around the world, which has decreased massively uh, over um, since 2000, where there was a real global push to redress the, uh, the amount of out of school uh, children. Um, but unfortunately, since 2008, uh, that really has slowed down and the reductions uh, have stopped. And I think that probably uh, reflects many of the process of stagnation within the field of international development since the global financial crisis. Uh, apart from focusing on issues of access to education, uh, a big issue has also been quality. Over half the children that leave primary school uh, around the world uh, leave with lower than uh, expected competence, competencies in reading, in mathematics. Uh, there are big challenges with employability, the nature of the education that's being produced, and many of our projects that we're working on also reflect those challenges. And one of the big uh, issues that has emerged, I think probably across all our field, is the increasing focus on the relationship between international development and conflict. Uh, half of those out-of-school kids around the world uh, live in conflict-affected contexts. And uh, more recently, the massive expansion of migration, uh, refugee crisis around the world, uh, has also led to a greater interest in the role of education for refugees, etc. And that, uh, in many ways, reflects the nature of the projects that we're involved in at the moment. We have several colleagues uh, supporting research on the integration of Syrian refugees in the Jordanian education system. Uh, we have uh, Linda Morris uh, leads that project with a, a range of colleagues. Um, Professor Yusuf Saeed is working in Ethiopia and Somalia uh, on a European project around the integration of refugees into the education system. Um, myself, over recent years, have worked a lot on the role of education in processes of peace building. Often, uh, education was always thought of as, as an afterthought in uh, peace processes and post-conflict reconstruction. Uh, but there is now much more of a greater recognition that education really matters, not just to people affected by conflict, but is often implicated in the drivers of conflict, why people take up arms and arms struggle in different places. Education is one of those drivers, or the lack of education is often one of those uh, drivers. So we also have projects on that. Um, more generally, we've done a lot of research over the years on gender inequalities in education and gender-based violence led by uh, Professor Mare Dunn, Barbara Crosswell, and a range of other uh, uh, different areas. Um, just to uh, move on a little um, to the question of where we fit in with the, research, uh, with the lecture series and, and the focus uh, this time, I think that uh, when we were thinking about our own contribution and the, and the different types of lecturers 
and lectures that we would like to support. We thought very much of a discussion that we've been having recently about the nature of knowledge production within the field of international developments, and particularly in the field of international education. And two of the lectures that we've supported, um, one is around the um, racism within the field of, uh, or the absence of an analysis of race within the field of education and international development. Uh, and we have Arati Shiprakash coming from the University of Oxford, who's done a lot of research around uh, process of decolonization, which has come up in other of the, uh, of the speakers today. Um, the second area, a new uh, colleague of ours, Dr. Nimi Hoffman, um, is uh, a new recruit from South Africa, who did her PhD research around knowledge production in Africa and the production of, of knowledge of African intellectuals. And I think that uh, her lecture will talk about the way and how uh, African intellectual communities survived during periods of structural adjustment. And I think some of the lessons of that may be uh, some of the politics of hope that we, we hope to, to address in this uh, lecture series around despite extreme diversity, uh, African intellectuals were able through Cordestria to maintain a disciplined intellectual uh, tradition. And I think that leads me just to a last few minutes, uh, if I may, um, to reflect on uh, a comment that uh, Mahmoud Mandani uh, in his uh, keynote to the Development Studies Association lectures, lecture um, this year at the Development Studies Association conference, where he talked about how development studies used to be a critique of empire, <laughs> but has now become a language of empire. And I think that it's worth, during this series, to reflect a little on the relationship between development studies more generally and imperial conquest. When we teach development studies, we often start post-Second World, post, post World War and talk about the Truman Point Three and the kind of optimism of coming out of the Second World War uh, and this idea of a kind of move away from colonialism. But colleagues in SOAS in the early 2000s Uma Kutari uh, being one, talked about how development studies was implicitly linked to the colonial mission, that it emerged in a sense as the carrot to the colonial stick uh, during uh, popular resistance to colonization uh, in India. And I think that uh, the fact that development studies has kind of swung from being the language of critique to the language of empire reflects a little bit about the way Development studies is very much subject to the changes in the balance of social forces around the world. And there are periods when a radicalism in development thought emerges, perhaps the 1960s and 1970s, that reflects possibilities. And I think a deep conservatism that reflects the reality today. Uh, a deep conservatism that's reflected in our, in our leaders that talk uh, of development as something that can be traded away either for security reasons or economic reasons. So we have our own Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson, trading international development assistance for whiskey reductions in whiskey tariffs in different parts of the world in a post-Brexit bargaining situation. And we have Donald Trump negotiating uh, secrets around uh, his political competitors in return for military or development assistance. And I think that that reflects the challenges that we have in the field of international development because we, as a research field, are so linked to the funding and trajectories of international development organisations that reflect those powers. And my own sense is that since 2001, the dynamics of security and the increasing securitization and militarization of the field of development, and post-2008, the increasing economization of development, or what's in it for us, giving money abroad, have started really to weaken the critical dynamic. And that's reflected in the field of education very much. Great amount of research into de-radicalization and the role of education therein, but very little critical reflection around the causes of conflict and the drivers of those. So I hope that during this lecture series, and during the study, your studies that, that you're coming to, that some of those critical discussions uh, will happen. And certainly, those are the kind of critical discussions 
that the Centre for International Education is trying to promote. Great, thank you very much indeed. And I think this book. Okay. Great. I think this bigger theme of the kind of location of development studies between kind of critique and the more instrumental forms of impact is absolutely one we can, is very much alive and well here and one we can pick up in the broader discussion. So, last but very much not least, Saurabh, tell us about what's going on in Spru. Well, first of all, thanks to Melissa. Peter and Mario for the discussion so far. And thank you for you all to be here, for being here today. Uh, my name is Saurabh Arora. I've been at SPRU for the last five and a half years now. SPRU is Science Policy Research Unit, for those of you who don't know. Uh, and SPRU is one of, the, one of six departments at the University of, Business, University of Sussex Business School. It's a new name, forgive me. I've got a cold. Um, and research and learning at SPRU uh, focuses on science, technology, and innovation policy politics and management. And SPRU is known around the world for path-breaking research on economics of innovation, on innovation systems, and learning by firms, innovative capability building in so-called developing countries, uh, techno-economic paradigms and long waves, rebound effects of energy efficiency improvements, plural pathways approach to sustainability, which has also been developed in collaboration with the STEP Center, which in itself is a collaboration between SPRU IDS and colleagues at Global Studies, uh, climate and energy justice, grassroots innovation movements and sustainability, and much, much more. In 2016, SPRU actually celebrated 50 years uh, of its existence. So it was set up in 1966. And uh, in these years, we've sort of helped uh, graduate 350 plus PhD students from around the world and uh, contributed to STI, science, technology, innovation policy making in many different countries as well. So that's my um, thing for SPRU. And I'm going to now talk about a couple of research programs that I think are relevant for the theme here today on Politics of Hope uh, that are ongoing at SPRU, developing as well at the same time. The first bit of current research is um, what is called Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium, TIPC, or the short is TIPC, uh, I hope no, no, <laughs> which I hope none of you are here yet. Um, TIPSI is specifically geared towards transforming the direction of uh, national research and innovation systems in order for them, to, for them to contribute more directly to addressing the SDGs. TIPSI research has built on the work of um, my colleague um, at SPRU, Professor Andy Sterling, on power and directionality to develop what they call the third frame of STI policy, science, technology, and innovation policy. Now, according to their frame, in terms of their understanding, the first frame of uh, post-war innovation policy uh, in largely the global north, but also influencing the south, was geared towards developing a science and research R&D system for innovation development. And the second one highlighted the importance of link with the demand side and users of technology uh, for wider interactive learning and what are called innovation systems. The third frame actually more directly focuses on contemporary global challenges, uh, by steering the direction of R&D and learning in innovation systems towards sustainability. Now that's TIPSI, it's on the website if any of you want to check it out and it's an ongoing program. They've got partnerships with many different countries, research systems around the world, I think 28 or 29 now if I'm correct. And the second program of research is also even newer than TIPSI. TIPSI has been around I think since 2016. And this is something that I'm working on along with colleagues at SPRU, uh, Divya Sharma, Barbara Van Dyke, Andy Sterling, Adrian Smith. And here we are directly trying to articulate our research with some sort of politics of hope being articulated by social movements for sustainability around the world. Uh, for example, in agriculture, in agroecology. Um, in India, we, people are talking about zero budget natural farming in permaculture movements around the world. And in energies, for example, through micro wind power, et cetera. So we are, what we are developing is a new framework for transformative politics of technology underpinned by what we are calling, what we're building on, care and conviviality. And care and conviviality are concepts or ways of modalities, of relational modalities that are meant to replace what we are calling control and domination. Control and domination being the hallmarks of modernization, of modernity, of modern technology, modern science and technology. Um, and of course, remembering that modernity cannot be separated from its what is often forgotten and hidden, or uh, Walter Mignolo calls it the dark side of modernity, which is coloniality, which Mario very, very wonderfully articulated just now. Um, so what control and domination 
driven technologies enact categorical borders, for example, between nature and culture, between subjects and objects, all for the purpose of technocratic determinism. Care and conviviality, on the other hand, demand a relational commitment to recognizing what have been hitherto called objects, particularly in nature, as subjects with agency, aiming towards a politics of autonomous reciprocity and decolonizing mutualism. Politics of hope then it becomes, as care and conviviality becomes, uh, or implicates transformations, in transformations of modernity that are decolonial, that attempt to build a world in which many worlds fit, as the Zapatistas of Mexico aptly describe the pluriverse. Thank you. Uh, that's about the two pieces of bo two bodies of work that I wanted to talk about, and uh, I hope to see you all at some point in the future. Okay, great. <laughs> so. Wonderful. Well, thank you, colleagues. That's, um, in all cases, just a small taster of the rich array of work that's, that's going on in these various schools. And just a few points to make. I think there's a really strong connection in all of them between these research programmes and ideas you've been hearing about and, and teaching. And I think something that's very clear in, in, in this whole area is that um, we're dealing with an integration of research and teaching programs. So a lot of what you'll be thinking about and contributing to in lectures and classes and so on uh, is very much what is also the people who are, you're working with, the fellows, the lecturers, also thinking about. Um, and I think there are also, there's also a shared sense of, of actually radicalism. I mean, it would be very good, I think, to pick up on, on the challenge that Mario from Mamdani laid, laid down that is actually development studies or international development part of empire or able to be critical of it. I think we at Sussex would all like to think and believe that we are part of that radical critique and continue to be so despite some of the forces and difficulties in funding and conservative politics that, that one has to continue to battle against. But it is an ongoing challenge, and it's an often an ongoing struggle. So it would be good, good to have that as something to pick up on as well. So we've got around um, 40 minutes, actually, for some questions and some comments. Um, this is very much the opening of this series, so it would be an opportunity for all of you to... to raise some things that you'd like to see addressed in the course of, of, of this year and the discussions that we'll have in this room, or perhaps to pose particular questions about things that are going on in, in schools or tell me more about the work on such and such. Can't promise to answer all of those in detail now, but it will be a chance to, to, to see some leads and know who to get in touch with if you want to find out more. So maybe we should take a, a, a set of thoughts or comments or questions and then we'll come back to the panel and then take another couple of rounds, if that's all right. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, my name is Louis Adikola. I'm from Nigeria and I'm studying my Master's in International Education and Development. And um, I really want to thank all the panelists. You are our leaders. So I just want to thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing. Um, I want to start by saying that um, it is not, we've heard it a million times that, you know, Sussex is number one for development studies and it is one of the reasons why someone like me, I'm here. But there's also one very important thing that I've noticed. Um, this hall is probably one of the strongest halls in the world today because it is a gathering of young people who are really committed to the development in their communities. Yeah. And many people are actually leaders you know, from, of organizations and projects and have experience, a lot of that. And so I just want to ask if there is a way that um, while we are learning, because I've attended three lectures and it's like I've never learned in my life. And I, I, is there a way that we can synergize and build on all of these experiences that we are bringing from all of these different sectors, all of these yeah. different countries? Um, some, some of us already are working in climate change. Some, some of us, are, like I'm, I've been working in education. How can we start by bringing all of these ideas and experiences together so we can also be able to, maybe from now going forward, in, make more impact and record more outcomes so it doesn't just end in the researches and the data and then we don't have quality impacts to share for it. Thank you. Great. 
Great point. Good point. <laughs> OK, let's take some more thoughts and hopes, indeed, or fears as well, about what's going to be going on this year and in this, this course. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and actually, as the last um, questioner did, very good to introduce yourself and where you're studying as well, because that helps us all get to know each other. Um, my name is Esme. I'm studying uh, as an undergraduate graduate in international relations and anthropology. Um, I just thought it was quite interesting what was said about um, how the politics today uh, reflect conservatism across the world. And I was wondering, you know, uh, so Extinction Rebellion's March in, in April was one of the biggest mobilizations of people in uh, UK's history. Yeah. There's huge moves at the moment, especially from young people, uh, to sort of mobilize ourselves and make a political statement, but that's not being reflected in today's political laws, um, you know, by mm. the lawmakers. So I was wondering if there's, you mm. know, almost politics of hope, if there's any hope yeah. if, for the efforts that we're making. Yeah. Excellent. Who else? Any more thoughts? Everyone's very quiet. Ah, let's have a couple here. Yeah, good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nasiba Chemer from Mexico, and I'm studying de development studies. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy to see how all departments are collaborating. It makes me feel that I'm actually in the right place. Um, my question is more directed to Peter. Um, because that's the, the part that caught my attention when you were talking about um, the synergies that you had with civil societies. And uh, echoing a little bit uh, what the colleague of Nigeria said, um, what is the, the, the outcome of these um, collaborations? Has it resulted in some, you know, like packages or tools that can actually be applied in the, sorry, in the countries? Right, a really good question. And I think there was someone else just in front. No? Anybody else? Or shall we come back? Shall we come back to some of those, some of those points? Right. So, Pete, do you want to start? Why not? Yeah. Actually, is this microphone on, or do I need this one? Oh, you need that one. That's for those two. Oh, this is for those two. Okay. Uh, so, colleague from Nigeria, first of all. Um, how can you draw on your experiences, right? Uh, I mean, that's certainly my classes, and I'm sure this is true of lots of people. That's one of the first things, really, to work out the resources we have in the room. Because <laughs> all of you have often worked in government or business or civil society from different parts of the world, different experiences. And that's already a massive resource that we can and should be used in teaching to form theories, case studies, ideas, experiences, all of that. So that's one thing, like in the classroom itself, like drawing on all of that. I think across campus as well, you'll find there's lots of societies, debates, events, films, things like that, that you can engage with and sort of interact with other students and sort of bring, you know, your experience to bear on that. And then, of course, as, as someone else was talking about, there's protests going on all the time. XR are going to take over London again on Monday, <laughs> etc. So depending on what your issues are and what you feel most passionately about, there's so many opportunities in Brighton and London and more broadly, of course, to get involved. So if they, in the classroom, more broadly on campus, and then broader society, you know, channel all your wisdom and experience in all those directions. Uh, the question, yeah, what impact, you know, that you sort of alluding to mobilisations and... What difference does it really make? For me, let me just speak to an area that I work on is around climate. And I've seen a real shift just in the last few years on a whole range of grounds. Obviously, it's partly to do with XR and Greta Thunberg and those sorts of things. But it's a bigger shift that's going on um, around, for me, importantly, it's around the delegitimization of the fossil fuel industry. And that's been a long time <laughs> in the making. Um, and, it, you know, we've still got a long, long way to go. Um, but some of those industries are now running scared. I think they are losing their social licence to operate. And that's partly because of the mobilisations. It's partly because of those protests. Um, and I think, you know, we saw today, was it the Royal Shakespeare Company, you know, sever their ties. A lot of art industries are, are severing their ties. It's no longer socially acceptable to, to take the money off the fossil fuel industries. We've had campaigns on this campus that former students were involved with, to go back to the first question, driving divestment of uh, yeah. funds from Sussex University into the fossil fuel industry. And that's a sort of partial success that we won. So I think across all of these terrains, things are moving. Um, they're not moving fast enough, and it's frustrating. I totally hear that. But I do think it's moving. Uh, mm. some things are moving in a positive direction. 
Um, and then the question over here about sort of positive impacts. Obviously, it's hard to tell with something like the Rapid Transition Alliance. We're sharing materials and tools, and you don't know precisely how people use those and what sort of traction they ultimately get with them. But let me give you one concrete example, something Andrew Sims and I wrote a while ago, end of last year, and we published something in The Guardian on the case for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So it was a bit of a mad idea. It came after a couple of beers in the pub. <laughs> and we were making the link back to the nuclear non-proliferation treaty because it was the anniversary of that and trying to link those two things. And it got a lot of traction. Suddenly, Naomi Klein and Bill McKibben and others were writing in support of it. There's now an NGO campaign around it. There's resources to try and actually... We're going to try and draft what this treaty could look like. And there are various countries around the world. We've been talking to different delegations that might run with this idea. So you never quite know when something's going to... When you hit the zeitgeist or when something's going to take off. But I think there are positive instances of where that, where that is happening. Yeah. OK. Great. Really good responses there. Um, um, sorry, I'll go along in this direction. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Um, to draw on students' students uh, experience and backgrounds, I think there, of course, uh, Peter's already mentioned there are ample opportunities to do that on campus, but also in the classroom. You know, all of our classrooms are geared towards participation and discussion. And it's not just to come here to learn from us. I think you learn from more from each other. And to build that community to facilitate that is part of our job as, 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 uh, as lecturers and, and people who are based at Sussex so that you're able to learn from each other's experiences. Okay, the other thing about things moving in positive directions, I, I am concerned. I think a lot of my colleagues at Spru are also concerned that as things are claimed to be moving in directions of sustainability, at the same time we're entrenching what we think are the underpinning uh, modalities of, of modernity, control and domination of nature, mm. control and domination of people who have been inferiorized mm. historically on the basis of race, culture, civilization, gender, or uh, caste, um, and religion now. Um, so I think we have to be very careful when we start celebrating technologies that appear to be sustainable as solutions, mm. because they often hide within their folds mm other forms of control and domination. Mm -hmm. So I am circumspect about the promises of positive movements. Apart from the young people being on the streets, I'm very happy about that, and uh, I think that carries on, and the movement becomes, I'll be happier if the movement is recognized also for its diversity, rather than being centered on one person as being the hero of that movement in the form of Greta Thunberg, because the movement is much, much, much bigger than that, and it's a, it's a, it's a strategy to kill the movement by centering it on one person. A representative horrible strategy okay thank you okay uh, thank you very much and great questions and i think that um one of the reasons that attracted me uh to come to sussex a decade ago was something about the history and radicalism mm -hmm. of of the university of sussex and i think that that's really embodied in the students themselves and uh for those of us that went on strike uh, last year, uh, many of us wouldn't have been sustained without the real solidarity and support of many of the students, including from IDS, but from across the university. Um, reflecting a little bit on um, conservatism and you know, social mobilization, um, I was mentioning to Peter when he, uh, when he came into the room earlier that 20 years ago, we were on a panel together during the kind of heyday of the anti-globalization movement. And I came into academia um, really through uh, solidarity activities. I was in, involved with Columbia Solidarity Campaign and got interested in, in these areas of, of international solidarity. And my PhD was about popular resistance to privatization in Colombia. Um, and as I got into academia, I got much more into mainstream research, international development, working for development agencies, for organizations. And after two decades of that, I'm now doing research on the production of knowledge in radical social movements. And I've kind of come back to where I started two decades ago. And I think there's a reason for that, because for me, if there is hope, it is in those social movements, in those radical opposition, particularly in the global south, who every day risk their bodies, risk their lives to resist authoritarian rule. At the moment, we're working in Turkey. 
uh, where thousands of acad academics have lost their jobs, teachers, where many people are in prison, and yet the organization, the HDK that we work with, continues to resist and to struggle. So I think that, you know, if, uh, if we think of uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, the Portuguese uh, philosopher and, uh, and, and theorist, he always talks about the global south as a kind of metaphor for all of those that are outside of the benefits of the global capitalist system, regardless of the geographical location. And I think that is where the hope lies, the popular resistance. Okay. Great. So just a, a, a couple of additions from me. I think the point about, um, about students and people who study here as a source of expertise, of knowledge, of wisdom, of activism is certainly something that runs through IDS teaching as well. I had the opportunity, I hope, to say that when we had our introduction with students last week, and I hope you're beginning to see that in the classes you're part of. Um, it's what makes these places come alive, and I think there's a strong sense across, across all of our schools and units that that actually teaching is about mutual learning and it's about sharing of experiences. Um, but it's also, I think I would absolutely agree, about sharing a kind of ethos of sort of scholar activism, really, which I think is really quite particular to, to Sussex. It's true of IDS, it's true of these other, other schools. Um, it's about not just wanting to understand the world but wanting to change it seeking the alliances to, to do so, which is very often with grassroots movements, social movements, the way they connect up into powerful forces of change. Um, it's the, the, the forces and the energies, the social energies that are coming from young people, absolutely part of it. But social energies can come from many, many other places as well. And I think it's some of those experiences from all of you that we'll all want to draw, draw on and think about, certainly being the case in the work we've been thinking about at IDS around, around tackling inequalities. For instance, the, the, one of the projects I mentioned on, on backlash against gender justice. I mean, this is a, a situation where there have been big gains for women in terms of political and economic empowerment. This is actually a program that's focusing on South Asia, on, on Nepal and India and Bangladesh and Pakistan. But yet, as women have become more powerful, have also been repressive, more conservative forces, um, which have, as it were, tried to quell those, those, those gains. And so that's a programme which is working very directly with, with women's movements and feminist movements to say, how can women sustain the gains they've made and hold on to them, even in the face of, of conservative forces? So finally, that's the other point I wanted to make, because I do think that over the last few years, we, we are seeing a series of, you could call it disruptions, you could call it breakdowns, you could call it contradictions in the world we're living in and in the context in which we are all trying to address global challenges. This is a world which is seeing um, more right-wing authoritarian populism. It's seen a closing down on the space often for progressive civil and political action. It's also seeing a closing down on... Um, the valuing of evidence and knowledge, actually. I mean, we've, we've seen it where, where politicians have said, oh, we don't, people don't trust experts anymore. And where, frankly, um, politicians are putting out fake news and sound bites which have very little grounding in, in the storylines and truths of anybody at all. It's not just that they're the biased stories <coughs> of the elite. It's actually they're not anybody's evidence. And so this is the context in which I feel development studies actually has, has to respond. And, and I take it, I'm taking it as a call to action, call to action from all of us. We've got to stand up against these disruptions. We've got to continue to speak truths in all their plurality, um, in all their pluriverse, to use the, the phrase that Zorab used, to power in all its disguises. We've got to not let... Our, our activism, our movements, and our progressive knowledge be closed down by, by conservative forces. Um, and we somehow got to keep alive hope. Now, what you do with that hope, I think there are a lot of different answers, and we've been talking a bit about activism and movements. I think um, one of the things we think about a lot at IDS is if we better understand the politics of policy processes, can you also find other ways to... to identify some positive actors you can work with or build alliances with those who are going to be supportive 
or even, to use a phrase actually often that Andy Sterling in Sprue has used, to be a Trojan horse, to, to kind of bring, bring um, even if you think you're doing a programme which is kind of buying into something rather unprogressive, you actually use it to smuggle in some rather more radical ideas and get into that space and it open it up from the inside. So I think we have to be politically savvy in the way we work with, with, with knowledge um, in, in the politics of, of development. I hope we can all do that together. So, um, yeah, I think we, we, we've got some more time. So if people would then perhaps like to share, I mean, it would be good to hear, as well as questions, some more of your own experiences, perhaps, in, in keeping alive the politics of hope in difficult circumstances. Could I maybe suggest something? Yeah. Um, I was interested, in fact, in finding out what you all associate hope most directly with. Yeah. What's hope for you? Um, anybody can volunteer. What is hope? What's hope for you? What do you associate hope most directly with? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that would be good. Let's get a collection, collection of thoughts on that. I mean, of course, more questions are also welcome. They are? No <laughs> but if there's no hope, then we're... <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's somebody at the back. Gentleman at the back there. Oh, and, yeah, okay. Your way around. I didn't succeed as a comedian, can't you? Uh, <coughs> mine's more of, a, of an answer than, uh, than a question from uh, uh, our Nigerian friend here. But we just have the most amazing forum for exactly what you're talking about. And it's called Robert Chambers Workshop. Yes. <laughs> um, they are happening this weekend on Saturday, or you can go on Sunday, and you come out of that full of hope. Okay, <laughs> that's a good, good advert. How many hundreds can you cope with, Robert? <laughs> I think we had 370 over the introduction ones, didn't we? No, that's great. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Amram from Sudan. I'm um, studying energy policy, but I'm a lover of ideas. Um, so I have a question by commenting on what politics of hope is for me. Um, because we've been uh, experiencing deep um, social change in, in the revolution in Sudan in the last eight months. Um, one thing I can... Sh I can share about it is that the main driver of what I see as an example of politics of hope for us was um, that um, common perceived um, understanding of the of the challenge we face. Uh, but more than that uh, was that common desire for change that that was deeply inherited in every individual, and the belief that that was possible that came about um, of maybe what we have that, that preserved culture of, of togetherness. Though we really, I think the world needs more of it now. Um, so going to my question, how, how the idea is keeping up, up to date with, with such uh, uh, changes that happens in, in the world? Um, for example, our, uh, the change that happened in my country that uh, entails um, socioeconomic changes, maybe in the whole African context. So thank you. Okay. Who else? Yeah, oh, yeah, somebody there and then come down to the front. Good. Um, I am Giada, I'm Italian, and I have a specific question for the Professor Novelli. <laughs> um, Okay, I was wondering, how, I'm interested in the Palestinian situation, the Palestinian issues. I've been working there for four months, and I found that as Trump just cut the fund to UNRWA schools, that he just provide schools in some refugee camp. Um, now, from this September, the Israeli government told that they will close all the UNRWA schools and they will replace the Palestinian curriculum with the Israeli one. So now my question is, as the Palestinian identity is based also in their curriculum, 
because they talk about Palestinian history, geography, and everything else. If the Israeli government just replaced the Palestinian curriculum with the Israeli one, and maybe some informal kind of education will arise, and maybe they can be driven by Hamas, it can be represent a problem to like a kind of terrorism led by Hamas in the informal education that they will give to children that are outside the formal school, the formal school system. Okay. I hope I'm, I made myself yeah. clear. Yeah, 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 no, sure. absolutely, absolutely. A very, very good and quite specific question there. That was great. So, James, I think we had a couple of people at the front. Yeah. And do shout if there's anybody on our online audience who wants to ask anything. Yeah. My name is Colby. I'm originally from the United States. I'm studying um, MA development at IDS. Um, I had a specific question more with using technology mm. um, and how that might affect sort of the continuation of imperialism. Because yeah. um, technology now, both in education and in climate change, um, there's lots of great strides, new electric cars, um, using computers for education, um, the need for connectivity for yeah. the internet and other things like that. But a lot of these companies, of course, are mm not well known for sort of using the sort of proper yeah. um, sort of labor laws and things like that. So how do we use technology or use things that might have um, positive impacts, but also have huge negative mm. impacts going yeah. forward? Yeah. Really good question there. Yeah. I'm Saloni. I'm doing MA Development Studies. Uh, I'm from India. So coming to your question of hope in politics, so looking at the current political climate in our country, so uh, I want the right to dissent and not branded as anti-national in my country. And uh, it should be my prerogative to, be, to agree or disagree with the policy of the government. So yeah, that's my comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, good. Um, and there's one, yeah, right at the back there. Uh, sorry, um, I'm an undergraduate second year taking IRID. I'm from Japan. Um, you mentioned education would lead to a more peaceful or peace building. Uh, there was some saying that you mentioned that you should look at politics for policy making, but should development be involved with politics? Or to what extent do you think development well, yeah, sh should have involvement with politics. Because if you want to build, uh, if you want to change the education globally, make it consistent so that everybody learns equal things equally, you need to, well, right now, every single nation, the government controls the education. You cannot create a unified education. So, how political can development become mm, okay. for it to be safe, sincere, okay. keep its cleanness? Okay, good question. Let's take a couple more and then I think we'll come back to the panel and then we'll be nearly out of time. Anybody in our online audience want to ask anything? Nope, not at the moment. Let's carry on in the room. <laughs> yeah, so we've got one here at the front. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Maysam, I'm from Libya, and I'm doing globalization, business and development and ideas. So my question is a little bit about migration, education mm -hmm. and conflict. Yeah. Uh, we talked about education a lot, but then targeting refugees and reintegration within the system of the country already. When there's a migration situation that's going long, uh, longer than the status of a refugee and asylum yeah. seeker sort of level, what sort of um, maybe research or um, ideas you've maybe worked on targeting migrants in like conflict area. And then how is it um, perhaps working on research in a targeted of a conflict area when also a migrant situation occurring as well? How accurate would it be? How is it working with um, maybe civil society actor mm -hmm. and um, that trans, um, and how legit is it basically in a way? Yeah, 
Okay, excellent. So, anybody else? Last chance, I think, on this round. Yep, someone at the back there. Hi, I'm Yuni Chong from South Korea, and I'm currently in the Masters of International Education and Development. So, regarding the question about hope, like, um, I just wanted to share something about my home country. Like, we, re we are divided. And we recently had this political breakthroughs of historical summits between North, South, and the US. But then everything seems to be going backwards again. Like, it's always like that. But then um, I, ju I was just wondering if any of the research units here have interest in like this Korean peninsula, because I believe like it's a very interesting case. North Korea is definitely one of the few cases where security overrides, yeah. like one of the very few countries where they don't attract much development assistance and humanitarian assistance yeah. because of security reasons. And also like the Korean Peninsula be, being divided because of the Cold War, which again goes us back to modernity and all that. So I just wanted to know if you have any ongoing projects or any plans to delve into this field. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the panel, maybe starting at that end, and I've got two quick questions. So I want to respond to any of the array of what came up. And then I'd also like to hear from each of you, where do you see hope in, in the broader development field? And secondly, what is your biggest hope for this lecture series this year? <laughs> okay? First respond. First respond and then, and then just a quick, a quick, quick thought on each of those two questions well, about hope. Great questions, but unfortunately too big to answer. Uh, in this short period. Um, I think that, you know, the, the question of uh, Palestine is a really difficult one. And I think we know that uh, in this world, there are legitimate victims and illegitimate victims. No? Some people's human rights matter and other people's don't. And unfortunately, the reality of Palestinian people is that uh, it's now almost become a crime to defend the rights of Palestinian people. And over recent years, there's been a sustained attack on UN institutions that have been working inside uh, the occupied territories. Um, and UNRWA has taken the brunt of that. And it's really sad to see this issue. And I think that you, know, you, you make a very good point that possibly the closure of these UNRWA schools due to the lack of funding and uh, uh, the pressure that's been put on uh, UNRWA will lead to the unintended outcomes that you suggest. You know, that you know, development is very much a process like that, that we think that something, you intervene and something will happen and another thing very different happens. And I think that you know, with the issue of Palestinians, uh, uh, we really don't know uh, where that will go. But I think that that's a very good, uh, uh, good point uh, to make. Um, I think I can answer kind of both questions around technology and education, I hope, because I think that um, within development, development itself, for that matter, is not a given good. No? When you come into a class, you say, I'm studying development studies. Do you see that with a badge of honor or a badge of shame? <laughs> it depends, because precisely the things that have been done in the name of development or education or technology have also been shameful or incredibly positive. No, so we have to get into the details of the nature. Yeah. What type of education? Yeah. For who? Who is included? Who is excluded? So it's all of those issues, which are, unfortunately, I have to say, is a political issue. Yeah? You can't avoid uh, politics. And Paolo Freire always talked about this, that education, by definition, is political. So I think that we have to embrace that, take sides, and engage in the attempt to transform uh, social reality as best uh, we can. Um, on the question of South North Korea, we would love to do research. I don't think there is any in our Center for International Education, but recently we've had several uh, uh, South Korean students that have done the most remarkable essays and thesis that are precisely around these issues. So we're learning and we're learning more about yeah. these topics. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, Mario. But Mario, so what about your hopes? I wanted to finish, I finish with you your hopes. You can see where my hopes lie. Okay, and what's, your, <laughs> what's, and what's your hope for this series? What would you like to learn? Um, I, I think that um, my hope for the whole engagement of, of, of our consortium is that we nurture an attitude within our field of development studies that we respect 
an ecology of knowledges, yeah. that we don't presume that all knowledge is coming from the North and that the North has answers, Absolutely. that there is knowledge in social movements, in the Global South, and that this lecture series will reflect that commitment to the flourishing of a range of different ideas. Great. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Um, let me start with development and politics. I mean, I am a firm believer that development is inherently political, uh, not just political in terms of its distributions of distribution of its effects, but also the kind of worlds it brings forth, the worlds it puts in place as and the worlds it destroys in the process of putting in place new worlds. So I don't think we can actually ever try to separate politics out of development. In fact, that would be doing disservice to development if we did that. Now, uh, the question of technology, which I uh, figure I can talk about a little bit as well. Um, uh, yes, they have been implicated in the Imperial Project. They, they continue to be primarily largely developed in the Global North and then diffused, distributed, adopted in the Global South. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's important to remember that people have appropriated technologies in different ways to even fight back against the empire yeah. Yeah, in the South. Uh, so it's not given, it's not predetermined how technologies are going to be used. Even though they might have a script, they might be descripted in the South differently than the script was intended, was intending them to be used for. Mm -hmm. So while uh, appreciating that, at the same time, we can't also deny that there is a script of each, of each technology. And if that script implicates or directly asks you to control or built upon control of nature or domination of nature or control of labor, control of the working classes, or control of people who are on the receiving end of exploitation of nature, then I think we have to we'll try to move beyond it. And unfortunately, a large range of modern technologies have been implicating such control and domination of nature. Mm -hmm. And that's why we stand yeah. with the earth on its knees now. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be here with the unsustainability challenges that yeah. we are facing now. OK, and uh, hope. Your hopes. hope. Uh, my hope, hope, hope for um, the world, hope for the series. Well, I, I grew up in Kashmir. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've heard what's going on there. <laughs> so my hopes, and I don't know whether you've seen, Hamid Dabashi wrote uh, recently an article in Al Jazeera talking about Kashmir, Palestine, and Hong Kong in the same breath. He says these are ruins of the British Empire. And I wouldn't, I, I, you know, I wouldn't agree with him by saying ruins of the British Empire. I would say these are ruined lives of the British Empire, that the lives that the empire continues to lead. Um, so in that sense, I think the imperative to, to decolonize, to reject superiorism, mm -hmm. superiorism of knowledge, superiorism of any cultures or people, is the imperative task yeah. in front of us. Yeah. And that's what I hope, that we at least begin the process of rejecting superiorism of all kinds in this lecture series. And that's right. my hope too. Excellent. Pete. Great. Okay, so let me respond to a couple of the issues that came from the, the audience. Yeah. So the first one around Korea, because that's an easy one. We've got Professor Kevin Gray in the Department of International Relations, is a specialist on labour and political economy in Korea. So please get in touch with him. Uh, the question about technology, let me pick up on that one, because I think that's a really important issue, and it sort of speaks to something that uh, Sora had flagged earlier. I think the key thing is not to sort of fetishise the role of technology in, in bringing about solutions and sort of, again, bringing it back to climate and energy issues, the big push towards electrical uh, vehicles. Uh, if that's done in the same way without unsettling power relations, if it's done in the same extractivist mode, then we're just going to get a rush for uh, lithium <laughs> and other sort of rare earth minerals to drive this sorts of thing. So unless we talk seriously about other ways of uh, addressing mobility needs trying to reduce demand, you know, fundamentally rethinking why we need transport systems rather than just plugging in a new technology and everything else stays the same. And I see that across, that's not just around sustainability, I see that in health and other areas, the same sort of thing, is sort of the rush for the quick fix and the next, next technology for finance to invest in is a problematic mindset and it won't fix mm -hmm. a lot of the problems we're trying to deal with. Uh, sources of hope. Um, Partly related to that for me is the sort of the growing critical conversation around the relationship between growth and development, you know, mm. shifting and challenging very conventional ideas yeah. about growth and asking, um, you know, separating growth as a means and an end. You know, for so long the development industry has been about growth assumed to be a good thing under all circumstances for all people. Um, and increasingly people are asking questions about um, 
good growth, green growth, growth for whom, growth of what, <laughs> different indicators, all of that. And I think that's absolutely mm. fundamental. So the more we can open up that space, the better. Mm. The hope for the series then is that we keep coming back to Mario's questions that he posed around, you know, development's implication in some of these yeah. problems and yeah. the development industry in particular, some further yeah. reflection on its own complicity in some of the processes we're talking about. So yeah. that's a job for all of you if you're going to come to other talks is to make sure those issues stay on the agenda mm. and keep asking the awkward questions. Okay. Excellent. And so finally, a couple of thoughts for me. Again, some quick responses to specifics, just to point to some areas. So technology, in addition to the points that, that Pete's made, we have a digital and technology research and knowledge cluster here at IDS, which is looking particularly at the, the positives and negatives of digital technologies. So the, the expansion of services and voice, really, or actually the kinds of digital inequalities and dangers around surveillance and privacy and control that are emerging. So that definitely a group to link up with. On Korea, um, I mean, Korea and South Korea has been a, a long-standing focus of IDS work around, around economic miracles and the rise of value change and new, and new forms of the, of the Asian drivers and economies. These days, I think a lot of our work in relation to, to Korea is actually linked to work on China, and we have a center for rising powers and global development and an emerging set of connections with Chinese partners and are looking at what some might call a new axis of imperialism um, linked from China and the East, moving out along the old Silk Roads and the Silk Road Maritime Belt, a very different source of origin of political and economic power and, frankly, knowledge power, which is shaping our world in a very, very big way and, I think, challenging some of the ways we think about old colonial axes, actually the, the work that's going on here and with partners around the Belt and Road Initiative is, I think, offering a, a, a different point of view and a very, very interesting one. Um, migration and conflict and education, um, I can't remember who it was who asked that. Um, we've actually got several projects in IDS in our conflict and violence cluster. Gautier Marché and others is leading projects on exactly this. How do you deliver education in an appropriate way in really difficult conflict zones? So um, a chance to find out a little bit, little bit more about that. Um, and then a broader point, I think, was raised in relation to Nigeria, if I got you right. I think you were saying, how is it that one can know in research that's done here about what's actually going on in particular countries? And, of course, part of the answer to that is not just that we have many students from those countries bringing their experience, but that also we're constantly working with partners, with research organisations, civil society organisations, think tanks, independent researchers, teachers, learners, in diverse countries. And actually any project that, certainly all the ones I put up, but probably some of the others as well, are not just led by researchers here. They're consortia, they're networks, they're partnerships. And so that brings me, I think, to my, um, my hope area, actually. I mean, I think the hope for, for development studies into the future is that it's a process of, of, of mutual learning and mutual critical learning where we can all appreciate that, that we've got experiences to share, some positive, some really negative, and actually how can we bring those together in a mode that is truly decolonial? Um, I think in particular, working in a world that is inherently about the politics, the politics of action, but also the politics of knowledge, trying to, to do that mutual learning thing in a way that keeps alive the different critical traditions we can all bring, um, is really important and has to be what development studies is all about. I would also differentiate, and I think this is part of my hope for this series, um, differentiate between development as in the discourses and practices of the aid industry, um, which is where I think many of these critiques of complicity quite rightly should be levelled. And actually development as processes of change, which can be highly damaging, excluding, marginalising, controlling, but also offer the prospects for positive change, um, which is, I think, what, what in different ways we would like to see development as being all about. So let's keep that distinction alive and I would hope for a series where we get some really powerful examples as well as some strong critique of the political economy of development, um, but also some really powerful exemplars and ideas that we can all live with in building this politics of hope in an era of really serious global challenges. So thank you to all of you for your questions and for coming along today. 
Thank you to colleagues. Um, thank you for being part of this kind of development studies thinking which happens on this campus. It's quite unique. Um, and let's hope we can all take it forward together over the coming year. So thanks. Big clap for everyone.